So everybody welcome. First session of the day. I guess right after coffee break. We just aren't awake yet. I know I'm not. Um, welcome to our core conversation. Less is more. So the primary tenet of this conversation is really about um, components that are in core, how they are maintained, and really having a discussion about whether or not certain things should be removed from core. Um, and what that process might potentially look like, what are some hurdles to that process, whether or not anything should actually be removed, additions, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a large topic. Um, I'm David Hernandez, I work for FFW. Uh, my role is largely training, but I'm also a coordinator for our contributions and community activities. And this is Peter Willannon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Willannon. Uh, I work for Biorep currently. I'm an application architect there. Uh, uh, Pete Willen and Drupal at Oregon have been a longtime co contributor to Drupal Core and on the uh, Drupal security team also. And you're wearing the same shirt. <laughs> and I'm wearing the same shirt just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> We're both from New Jersey and we rock with our sprints in our camps, in our meetups. <laughs> okay. So, um, some history, some baselines, right? Why might things be removed from Core? Um, so this has happened in the past, obviously, certain things, modules, components, APIs, and things like that have been removed in the past. Um, but what is sort of like the rule set, the baseline we've sort of adhered to? Um, some things are inherently insecure, like we've removed the PHP module because of that. Um, sort of even if there was nothing wrong with the module itself, it was pretty much a bad practice to have people embedding PHP everywhere and it creates all kinds of problems. So we decided that was a very good reason to get rid of that thing. Um, some modules have, essentially, we've just moved on from the technology and the things that, that they do, like the OpenID module was removed because of that. Again, not necessarily anything wrong with the module itself, but when you start having use cases of like, why do we need this thing anymore? It's not really something people use very much anymore. That's another good reason for why something gets removed. Um, if they're, you know, it's pretty much the same thing as the next bullet point. If they're not commonly used, they don't have good use cases, their features are not particularly good. You know, those are all, uh, reasons why something starts getting on the hit list. Um, lack of maintainers and interest, I think, is something that we, sh we should talk about more um, because, and this goes along with things like the technical debt and innovation and things like that. You know, there are a, a good number of modules that exist in core right now and are there, I think, essentially for just the feature set so that they are something that we can identify as being part of core as a feature, almost, you know, I call this sort of like the marketing bullet list of being able to say that like out of the box, Drupal does these things, right? But those modules are often there, even if, even if they're not insecure, they're not buggy or anything else, they often will lack feature sets, um, they lack innovation, people are not paying attention to them, um, they don't have anyone who's giving them attention and putting effort into them so they start stagnating, right? Um, and often it's, they're better off not being in core uh, and being in contrib instead. Um, and then, yeah, better alternatives. So sometimes, uh, and we see this all with a lot of things, I think. Um, there's always better alternatives that are in contrib. So people will tell you things like, oh, I never use the forum module. I always use advanced forum instead. And anyone who ever builds a site with forums will use advanced forum instead of the forum module. So it's like, why is that even there? And I think it's there just to say, we have forums and core and you can use it out of the box. So we do have some modules that have been removed. Um, so like PHP module was removed for A, trigger, profile, poll, poll blog, those were all removed for various reasons. Um, but the one thing we want to really identify here and make the point of is these dates that were added for each one of them, right? So we went and looked at when the original issues were opened for these modules and then when they were finally closed and those things were actually removed. Um, and you can see it took, what, six or seven years to get rid of the poll module, right? So it's not always an easy process. It's not always easy to get consensus from people to get rid of things. Um, and sometimes it's not always easy to actually physically remove things because some of those modules can start becoming intertwined with various features that are within core. All right, so what are the consequences, right? Because nothing's for free. Um, so keep, you know, 
some people will say, well, just leave it there. Like, who cares? It's not a big deal. Why worry about it? We have other fish to fry. Um, but there's always consequences for doing that. Um, a big one is the stagnation for development. So some of those modules that are there, they're okay, but they could be a lot better. Um, I look at things like the form module or the color module, which I think actually do have value for people who are building sites and using those particular features. Um, but they will stagnate in core because often it's really difficult to modify those features, get them attention, um, get updates to them. Um, whereas if somebody's wor somebody who really loves and cares about those modules and works on it and can trib and has access to them, um, like commit access to those modules, can actually work on those feature sets, work on enhancements, experiment with different things, listen to the user base for those modules instead of just the entire core user base. Um, and they can prioritize the features that they want instead of core developers as a team having to work on their own set of priorities, which are going to be completely different. Um, and then maintenance burden, right? So it's not just the maintenance burden of the individual module because you have to look at core as a group, as itself, right? So uh, when working on core development, if like a patch needs to be made to modify an API, right, then it's not as simple as just modifying that API. If that API is used by seven different modules inside of core, all of those usage instances have to be updated. Um, and that can be kind of tedious when dealing with like, I have to update these five modules that like nobody uses anyway and it makes the patch so much bigger and more complicated and annoying and all of that has to be tested. If that wasn't part of core, it'd make that process a little bit easier. <coughs> all right, so what do we think would be the result of this if modules actually get removed? Um, so generally they would have to go to core, uh, go to contrib. I don't, I don't think any have been outright deleted yeah, they're always good to contrib, right. at least if someone has a theoretical path forward or upgrade path. Right. Um, but that means that somebody has to commit to maintaining that thing. And often I think I've seen um, cases of something getting removed get shot down simply because we can't find anybody who will actually maintain it. So it'll stay in core. It's like, who's going to take over responsibility for this thing? And nobody raises their hand, so okay, it has to stay where it is. Right, because what we'd have to do is move it out into a project page, it gets its own repo, and somebody has to be a maintainer, somebody's gonna have to pay attention to it, uh, look at the issues, commit updates and bug fixes and things like that, and if nobody does it, then it just kind of sits status quo where it is. Um, why we can't what? Can you clarify why we can't just take a module out of core, put it in contrib, and leave it unmaintained? Uh, well, every project has to have a maintainer, for one, but also there's always going to be people who were using it. Um, so there are, you know, whatever the use cases are, if somebody, like if we tried to do that, say, during Drupal 8's life cycle, Right, someone who was using that module still needs to have access to it and someone has to be responsible for it because bugs will be um, found at some point anyway. Unless you are, are you indicating some other point you wanna make? Well, I'm thinking if it's in core, then it has a stable release. And if we move it to contrib, we c it could be unmaintained there, but it wouldn't have a stable release. So it would be like, people would start getting alerts on their sites that Something that used to be fine is now like um, not covered by the s security policy because there's no maintainer for it. So it's not just like it's unmaintained. It's like it really, or that it's not going to get future development. It's going to like alert people and frighten them and all kinds of things. So, so to respond to that though, like is that the experience we want people to have if they installed Drupal and thought it was a stable core product? As a, right, why, if I turned on a module in 8.3 and in 8.4 we decided it was terrible and removed it, is that, you know, it seems like that's breaking some promises about backward compatibility within the 8 series also. Right, like if it, it, if it actually is unstable, are we just masking it because it's part of core stable release? Uh, and don't we have the, like the abandoned modules user that sits around in, on Dribble.org for abandoned modules. 
Yeah, we do, but that's really, you know, those modules are, are marked like completely insecure. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there's a, technically we could do that, but it, it would have the same problem. Like everyone who thought they'd installed part of four is now going to get an alert. I was also going to add that you can move something into contrib and then leave it in the composer so that it's still being uh, still being required and added into it, but it's being brought into the contrib space so that other people can maintain it, maybe speed up the development of something like the forum module to bring, you know, so that people who are interested can add to it. I, th I, th I think you're trying to ruin our finale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Spoilers. That's all right. Yeah. Yes, great suggestion. <laughs> um, I also would, would, I would be careful about um, uh, putting a module in contrib and doing something like attaching it to the uh, abandoned maintainer user account because I, I, I do still think that if you try to remove something definitely at least within a major release, there is still an inherent contract that we've made with people that are using that module that we have to pay attention to and not just suddenly in a minor release say, well, screw you, this is now abandoned. Sorry. You, we already have the experimental like package, so we could create a workflow of moving things into an abandoned thing where it's not actually removed, but it's basically a deprecated module mm -hmm. and let people know that, okay, you know, on this minor release, this is now here, but now we're going to be moving it into the contrib space and still keep it a part of uh, the core, you know, composer like we were saying before, but at the same time, still allow for people to be notified that it's being moved out of Yeah, form. I think, I think um, that would essentially be the workflow regardless of what form it actually takes. It would be to like up deprecate the module at some point. Um, although that, that would be another conversation. It's like moving something out, is it really deprecated or is it just m moved, right? So like with deprecation, there's like, um, there's an implication that it's something that was replaced or is no, will no longer be functioning and basically going into the trash, like with a deprecated right. API or something like that. So Whereas, is the wrong term for it, right. but it's the same philosophy. But it, it's, it's, it's an easy way to actually sort of manage that release, like right? because we can deprecate functions and APIs and things like that. We might like tag the modules as deprecated or maybe there's some others tagging some status for that that would be slightly different. So uh, we compiled kind of a list of going through the maintainers file and just finding everything that currently is listed as not having a maintainer. Um, these were recent updates um, that were made to the maintainers file because um, we basically went through, looked at everything that was in there and actually contacted people that were listed as the maintainers of these things and were like, are you still mainta maintaining this at all or do you, are you interested in it? And if not, we'll just remove you from the maintainers file. If you look on Drupal.org, there's, uh, there's actually a page now that lists sort of like the Ameritai maintainers for things like that so that we can remove people from the file that's actually in Drupal core. But you can see like this is, this is the current state of things and this was the current state of things even when people's names were actually still there. Um, so these modules are definitely getting less attention. Although I think we have a couple in there that it's kind of unclear whether or not they're just wrapped into something else, like the asset library API, I think it's probably one of those cases. But things like aggregator, the band module, color module, um, tracker, um, probably both core themes. Uh, the mod node module even now has no listed maintainer, um, although that's probably just gonna be like, oh, everybody has to maintain it because it's not getting ripped out anytime soon. Um, but you know, it's something to consider. Like when you actually go and ask people whether or not they're interested in continuing to have their name attached to this thing as being responsible for it, um, a lot of people weren't actually doing it and wanted to drop out for whatever reasons. Um, Can you use the mic? No. Uh, so this was just a list of modules that are in core right now that do not officially have a maintainer for them. So it does not mean that you're going to cut this module no. from core? No. Okay. It just, we're just making the point of all the things that are listed in core are supposed to have a maintainer, someone that's so, yeah, giving okay. them attention. 
And right now, these are all of the components that are in core that officially do not have anyone listed as giving them attention. Okay. Um, which we would see as a problem because, again, you have stuff that's sitting there that will stagnate because no one's giving it attention, right? So is that a problem? Okay, so, yeah, we sort of s took that previous list as a possible starting point. And clearly, yeah, some, a lot of those things are critical, you know, even if there's nominally not a maintainer, there, you know, there's no way we're going to remove the database drivers or, you know, the node module or the authentication system, you know, those are central to Drupal's functioning. Um, but we, we, you know, took a, a sort of broad swath of, you know, modules that didn't have, mostly didn't have a maintainer or um, it wasn't clear what their use case was in core um, and decided we're just going to put this up as kind of a discussion list and sort of, you know, talk about, you know, are, are any of these things, things that people in the room would say, yes, we should definitely go ahead and and remove, and then, uh, so hopefully this will spark a little conversation, and then we'll come back to, uh, yeah, discussing some, you know, possible ideas about going forward, how it could improve. Uh, sorry, I, Freight. I yeah. wanted to, to add one to the list, which was the, uh, I'm not entirely sure it's still in there, but the REST uh, basic auth um, module. Okay. I, that just seems like a security bug to me. Uh, you would be shocked how many even finance-related APIs use basic auth. So I wouldn't be surprised. But I, so I, I, I agree but I that agree. it's in, yeah, it's insecure, but it's it's also yeah. Usually the first thing people try to get their site their their REST API working. So it's it's really useful for developers. I agree. We should have some way to flag it as not suitable for production. Right. <laughs> so, so another thing that. I'm not sure if you looked into or like vendor packages or JavaScript libraries, front end libraries that may um, might also be on the discussion list. I can't name them off the top of my head, but have you looked into uh, those things? And if you have you found any that you know, what's the process for doing that and how that how that will affect um, uh, users? Yeah, I'm not sure. The front-end libraries are, are sort of a, a little more of a new frontier. I mean, clearly we swapped out the CK editor, so there is a willingness to upgrade those. Have you looked at how many are reported as being in use? Uh, we will come to that. There's not great numbers on that. There is some data that you can look at and see what you think about the data, but it, it's definitely a, a fuzzy topic. Oh, and good, Daniel's here. Now we can really start the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the things I, we wanted to throw on here was just a really rough idea of maintenance burden uh, for these modules. And um, these slides are posted, so you don't have to try to copy this URL down. Um, the PDF's on the, <laughs> on the session already. But basically what I did was, was just apply some filters and say, okay, well, let's look at, you know, uh, issues that were created in basically the Drupal uh, and currently assigned to Drupal 7, 8, or 9, and they were created since Drupal 8 was opened, and their bugs are tasks, and they're at least normal severity, and, you know, the statuses were reasonable to suggest that they either were legitimate and were fixed, or were legitimate and not yet fixed. Um, uh, just, again, to give us an idea of how, you know, how much activity, basically, the, the core maintainers had to deal with around these different modules. This is a totally rough metric, um, but just want to give us some idea how these different modules uh, compare. Um, and then, you know, let's just dive into this list. And one of the things is, I'm not sure, for a lot of these, I didn't even know what they did. And so that's partly why I put them on the list. I'm like, if I don't have any idea what this module does, possibly we should just remove it, right? <laughs> um, and so the actions module provides tasks. That's really great, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many people here think they are using the actions module in, on a Drupal 8 site? Yeah, well, okay, a couple of people. Um, so, you know, I was the same way. I was like, I'm, I don't know what this does. I'm not using it. Um, uh, and if you enable the module, it exposes configuration for actions plugins, but there's really no obvious way to use that in core. Uh, and then as I started asking around, I discovered that actually the actions API is used to provide views bulk op operations in Drupal 8 core, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, so. This actually turns out to be really useful, but no one knows that it's what it is or what it does. But if you go to like the content overview page and there's operations like unpublish these nodes, that's actually using this API. 
So does action module provide the plugin API? Because I always thought that actions are part of core. Like yeah, actions are part of core, core, and so the module just provides a little way you could configure some of them and then, oh, and then use them. Because the VBO thing is part of system module. Yes. It's like, yeah. Right. <laughs> So, so that's, yeah, so that's part of the Actions so API. So is Actions just the UI then? Like the, the web page, like the form a, uh, UI? It's, yeah, it's just the one, it basically just provides the UI to configure the, some of these. Um, so, um, and you know, we saw like the maintenance burden wasn't too high from this either. You know, we spent some time upgrading it from Drupal 8, but it uh, isn't a big thing. So probably this is not a great one to remove from core because we wouldn't actually want to lose that bulk operations functionality. Um, uh, what's sort of funny though is rules module uh, uses its entirely own set of plugins. Um, so there's, you know, I had thought in Drupal 7 I think rules module would use the core actions also and in Drupal 8 that seems no longer to be true. So, um, you know, so this is useful but um, interesting, you know, that no one thinks that it's in use. Um, aggregator module. Um, how many people turn on aggregator module for Drupal 8 site and actually pull in feeds? Ah, a few. <laughs> yeah, use the mic. No, we really want to hear what you have to say. Or, or, or I'll, yeah. Yeah, for the report. Okay, uh, we using actions and aggregator modules. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, that's great. So, you know, there's probably like four or five people in the room using aggregator. Um, so, but, you know, is this something that should be in core? Is there a big use case for aggregating RSS feeds into your site content? I'm not sure. Um, this is, I was a little surprised. This one actually seemed to have the highest maintenance burden, the num largest number of issues against it since the Drupal 8 cycle started. Um, and it may be, you know, there's a lot of fiddly bits of parsing XML that were in there. I'm just thinking, if we just get everything out of the core, then again, we have to have lots of plugins you know, installed to the core. There's going to be some you know, compatibility issues, some conflicts always. Some modules going to be in the dev version and you know, behind the core versions. And it's like, then we are ending up, our Drupal 8 modules is going to be like Drupal 7. For Drupal 7, we always to, to get something done. We use these plugins, that plugins, and always, I, I, I always, you know, face so many issues. So right. I was happy that the Drupal 8 comes, so many are in the core, and you don't need to install so many plugins. You know, right. they, they, they are also against the performance. <laughs> yeah, I think so, um, that's definitely an important consideration because yes. with the bundling of core, you get a consistency of releases yes. and stability, um, exactly. at least a coordination of features and development for those things as opposed to more of a Wild West that we get when things are maintained by different people in Contrib. Thank you. Er, your slide says maintenance burden three. Could you say a couple of words about that scale? Uh, yeah, that was how many pages of issues I found. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very you know rough uh, rough metric, but sort of range from one to three of uh, the ones I looked at. So uh, kind of piggybacking off of what she was talking about with the sort of like. The Wild West mentality that core is, or that contrib is versus the you know highly structured you know uh, maintainer structure uh, that we have with uh, core, you know we could do a multiple package core as well. Uh, they you know that's something that's very common in like on the GitHub you know side of things where you've got a like one big monolithic organization and then smaller packages within that, and mm -hmm. each one of those packages could have their own uh, developer you know and those. Yeah, you know, those maintainers could be considered like on a core maintainership, but in a just separate repository, in right. a separate package. Yeah. Good idea. We will come back to that. <laughs> uh, history module. How, how many people use history module? One, maybe two. People even know what a history module does. Yeah, are you sure? <laughs> but yeah, so this is, yeah, I feel like a narrow use case. It puts that little red flag next to content you haven't read yet when you're logged in. Um, great for Drupal.org. Uh, does that need to be in core? I'm not sure. Um, it did have a very low maintenance burden, though. That one I'd even put at 0.5 because there were very few issues against it. It's also a very small module. Um, statistics module. Anyone use statistics? Wait, you, you're using all these modules. Well, uh, 
I'm pretty sure the previous module depends on this module. Oh, okay. So if you're uh, using the previous no. module, I think it depends on no, statistics, they're independent. doesn't it? Oh, maybe that was with Drupal 7, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I am using both though. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so more or less one person. This, this is, you know, statistics module shows you how often content is viewed. Basically, this is like a built-in version of Google Analytics and, or any other analytics thing that you want to use. And I'm, why does Drupal need to be doing this itself? Um, you know, and, and one of the arguments I would say against this is that basically you have to have a, you know, separate front controller and you have to do a partial bootstrap of Drupal and write to the database every time someone views a page, even if they're authenticated and everything else is cached. Um, so, to me, you know, okay, as, as a checkbox, I can understand, I, I'm not even sure as a checkbox this needs to be there, because people, I don't see why people would use it. I, I was just going to add that uh, Drupal hosting providers blacklist this module and will tell you to remove it. It's like one of their performance concerns. Okay, there so, we go. Yeah. A great, yeah, support for that argument. <laughs> okay, so this one, you know, I think you could make a strong case that this should be gone in Drupal 9. Does anyone? No, ah, okay. Agreement. <laughs> Band module, and people are shaking their head. Do you even know what band module does? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you use it one time, okay. Anyone else using it? No one's using it, okay. Maybe one person using it. Um, so again, you know, uh, most people would put IP addresses in their HTTP access file if they needed to ban someone, or really, I mean, with distributed denial of service attacks and things like that, there's not an IP address that's a problem usually. It's usually hundreds or thousands and you can't, this strategy, you know, is kind of, you know, a 2001 strategy and not a 2017 strategy. So, um, you know, and basically every time uh, you want to ban someone, you're still starting through the bootstrap process, you're doing a database query, you're finding the banned IPs, okay, then you short circuit the page request, but again, it's, a, it's not an efficient way to block someone from your website. Um, so not a high maintenance burden, but still, to me, it doesn't seem like there's a great use for this in core. I don't know if it's on anyone's checkbox that the CMS can block by IP address. Maybe very old security checklists, and that's one of the things we, we feel like, you know, some of these things are basically being maintained because someone's 10-year-old security checklist says, can block by IP, um, <laughs> and that's the only reason the BAM module is still in core. Um, shortcut module. Um, how many people create shortcut sets for their users? Oh. That's like a good yeah. third of the room, at least. That's the most so far. That's the most so far. Okay, that's interesting to know. <laughs> I have to asterisk that with, I have no idea whether or not my users are using them. Right. <laughs> but we create them. Can I go back to the ban module for a sure. second? So uh, there's a similar thing in WordPress, and uh, but it's a plugin. Um, and what it does uh, that this could be useful for is that if somebody um, is trying to come in with a username that doesn't exist or too many attempts or a different number of things that you could select as criteria, it bans them immediately by IP within the CMS, but then it offers you the option of taking that list and throwing it out into HT access later. Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely ways to do this. I've, I'm, and I'm not saying it's not a legitimate functionality, just whether, you know, whether it's in core, needs to be in core, you know, whether it's a common enough demand that people want it in core. And I, I think that one has a, a pretty good, um, is a pretty good use case for supporting some of those arguments we were making about um, enhancements to features, right? Like maybe being able to pull out those IPs and to write them into an HT access file is, is a cool thing to do if that's the kind of functionality you need. But are the core developers going to spend time on that kind of feature when we're working on other things? Whereas if that's in contrib and somebody cares about it, maybe somebody's actually going to work on that kind of thing. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I left, left one of my notes there from the meetup where it said we should look at support burden, <laughs> which is why we have support burden numbers. Oh, well. Um, so this one, and this one actually, you know, had somewhat higher support burden. You know, so if, okay, a lot of people are using it. They're creating shortcut sets. You guys aren't, aren't sure that anyone's actually using them. To me, a lot of these things almost feel like browser bookmarks. Um, you know, is this, again, I, I would argue it's, it's kind of marginal. Yeah, I'd actually like to see it move to contrib, but we use it heavily. We've got a staff of about two dozen editors that have very cyclical workflows, and this allows them to create the workflow, quick access to the workflow pieces, 
that they need in a seasonal manner without involving dev, without them having to know the menu system. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so definitely some more support for this one than anything else. <laughs> I also wanted to point out that the maintenance burden, uh, burden of there being more pages of issues could also just go to you know, more people using that particular piece. Sure. So if more people are using it, then they're finding more bugs and they're putting those issues in. Yeah. Versus not. Yeah, it's true. I mean, so these things, and we can debate, you know, how you would measure accurately any of these, you know, either the maintenance burden, and again, the usage is not really accurately measured. So we're, we're at a bit at a loss. Well, and so this, this sporadically left comment in there, support burden versus usage graph, how do we calculate that? How do we determine it? Um, uh, it's certainly an outstanding question for all these modules, and, and I think if, if someone has ideas about how we could do that more accurately, it would be helpful to, to gauge these things over time. Um, tracker module, does anyone even know what tracker module does? No, it's that tab on your user profile that shows your most recent posts, or on someone else's profile, and a couple other things like that. Again, um, yeah, and a lot of SQL queries. Um, so, you know, there wasn't a lot of issues around this being upgraded, but is this, like, why do we have this uh, as a core module? And on a site like Drupal.org where there's maybe a lot of, you know, community content, this is useful. Did anyone else use this on their sites? See this as an important feature? <laughs> same, same one person, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know what you're doing with your website where you're turning on every core module. I mean, I, I think this is an important feature for community sites, but whether it should be in core, I don't know. Right. I mean, tracking activity and providing that to users is, is important for a bunch of community sites that, that I've built and, and maintain, because um, users want that functionality. Right, so I don't, I don't think we're saying any of these are, you know, bad modules, they're just, should this be in core? Like, is it enough of a use case of the core? And, you know, it doesn't seem and don't take me raising my hand as me using most of these modules as like me endorsing these have to be in core because I right. don't think that at all. Sure, that's fine. We're just trying to yeah gauge, gauge a sense of if it's actually used by anyone. <laughs> I just think that sometimes a benefit of a module like this being in core is that, and this might be a good example, it could probably be much more efficient if the uh, SQL that would normally bring the content in had a join added to it to bring in the rest of the data needed for this, joins are really inexpensive as opposed to another query. If it's a contributed module, you're not likely gonna have that happen. Uh, well, I'm, I know that even though if it's a core module, you might not have it happen either, but at least there's the option there of somebody looking at core and saying, well, we can make this more efficient by changing this Query we yeah, use. I don't. Well, I'd have to look at the code. I don't think that's actually the case. I think it's pretty. Um, there's no real assistance for this in the other parts of core to make it more efficient. Um, so okay, we could maybe cut that one. Um, forum forum module. So there's been issue to remove forum module open for four years. Um, so this is clearly on people's list of. We love it, we hate it, it could be better, we want it, but we don't want it. Um, how many people use core forum module on a site? Uh, we got like four maybe out of the room, yeah. A small, small percentage. Um, so a few people, but again, um, you know, uh, this I feel like forum module also missed an opportunity in Drupal 8, so there were a lot of, there was a push to try to convert a lot of the customized code in forum module to something more standard like views. And if you look at the code, that didn't happen. People just did a minimal upgrade and basically walked away and said, okay, you know, we don't want to invest the time and effort into doing this right. And to me, that's you know, possibly one of the strongest arguments for removing it. Like, no one cares enough to do this right when it was upgraded to Drupal 8, then probably doesn't belong in core anymore. Um, and it did you know, have a couple pages of issues you know, open since uh, Drupal 8 started. Um, so you know, it is causing some maintenance burden, um, even if people don't didn't really do very much in terms of the upgrade. Um, color module, I mean, this is sort of an interesting one um, that you know, only some themes support color module. Um, it's uh, you know, not clear that it's really a valuable feature for anyone who's like a professional developer, but you know, is this important for first time users? Is it important for the product to have the ability to recolor the theme out of the box to show that Drupal is flexible? 
What do you guys think? Um, for me, color module is kind of like overlay uh, in Drupal 7, but they forgot to remove it. But what? So they forgot to remove it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, color module uh, as, as a product feature is there because of Bartek. Right, so the ability for that product out of the box for someone to install and be able to just change the colors around as a, a first time user, a decision maker, an evaluator trying it out, that's really why it's been kept in there. It was there for um, the previous themes and previous releases, it's been kept, but it's also one of those modules where people just worked on updating it so it works in AAA and just walk away. Um, and as somebody who's actually implemented themes with color module, I can tell you that um, everybody hates it and everybody thinks it's a terrible idea and says why the hell is that there can we get rid of it but having used it a couple times I don't actually like using it but I understand the value for it like if you're building a distribution or if you're creating public themes and things like that but there's so many features that it misses um, and there's so many limitations to how it works and how you can actually use it to override colors in your site that I think if it was just in contrib, people would work on those features and like, make it work 10 times better than it currently does. Uh, you talked about this idea too uh, for like decision makers. So I'm wondering whether this more belongs into the distribution space, like because the distribution space like controls the entire product much better than core does. So for example, like Lightning could provide that. And then they, I mean, they also ship with a theme so they could actually make it useful. No, I just wanted to say pretty much everything that you just said, and I forgot to sit down, but it's a, <laughs> uh, I think that this is a very useful feature, especially in uh, in that core download of people who, you know, who go in, they start at the site. It's just like the, you know, like the example content, you know, uh, that uh, Dries was showing on you know, that with like the recipe. Yeah, I, I would put it in that category of useless to like 99% of people, extremely useful to the 1% of the people who actually need it. Right. right. So I, I'm reminded of one of the keynotes a few years ago. I think it was DrupalCon Portland. Um, the engineer, the designer, and the dictator. Um, so from the engineer's point of view, what are the criteria for something to be in core? You know, it has to be something flexible that can be used by lots of things and, and something sort of atomic that can be unit tested and so on and so forth. Um, but then the designer worries about the out-of-the-box experience and, and how are we going to sell this. And, and that's why we're, we're getting sample content in, in a theme in core. And, and these two points of view are, are I think, really in conflict. Um, and, and so the developer might look at the color module and say, well, this is a use case that, that different themes are going to want to use, so let's give them an, an API or a module that they can base it on. Um, and, and the de designer is saying, oh, let, let's, let's put in some, some, some good user interface and blah, blah, blah to this. But, um, but I, I think you do have to keep those two points of view in mind as we go through this discussion with every module. So I feel that all the discussion is going on around about what Drupal actually is as a product when you install it out of the box. But for a lot of us that use Drupal to build sites, we never use it out of the box. So I, I would be really happy to see Drupal move to a, like more of a framework-like software uh, and like completely drop all modules and just use Composer Require. I mean, you can handle a distribution using Composer Require, do whatever modules you need for every distribution, and like I won't use a lot of these modules. They're confusing when you deliver a website to a client and they say, I enable the <coughs> color module, it's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So I just feel that all of this can be handled better in Contriv. Maybe say have some, like, um, not core maintained, but like officially maintained modules that give the support to all the users that actually need it and uh, have Drupal more of a framework like okay. software. Great. I, th I think you also just st stole part of our conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, small core. Um, <laughs> So uh, part of that is like I started as a hobbyist back in like 2007, 2008, and a lot of a lot of people did start as a hobbyist. And if as a hobbyist, if I had to download and install Composer, which I didn't understand, I, I don't, that's difficult. I still don't understand Composer, <laughs> and do this, do all that stuff, it's very very difficult 
uh, to get people in there. And, and as I see Drupal moving into the enterprise space, I see us almost forgetting the hobbyist. Mm -hmm. And I think we can have both. You know, I like all this enterprise stuff, like I don't know, configuration management and Symphony and stuff like that. That's great, but the hobbyists can do that too. But what if we do something like small core and have everything in contrib? We need to develop some type of interface where a hobbyist can say, like, download the themes from within the u user interface. Or I like there's an issue out there that says like during the Drupal install process have some vetted uh, install profiles that will automatically down those and kind of figure out your composer dependencies for you and it will just kind of magically work. So uh, say if I have like a restaurant, I can select a restaurant distribution or something like that. And that would be completely Yeah, that's cool. like uh, dis distribution le level. But I remember you also, Peter, had that idea of like making Drupal.org actually do it. Yeah, I mean, there's a different, few different ways to approach this. I mean, one thing we were also discussing is, you know, do you want uh, essentially like a compo distribution builder on Drupal.org? So I, yeah, you know, in some cases you want a maintained distribution. In other cases, you want to say, I want these features. Please build me a custom distribution and basically record those decisions so I can get the updates going forward yeah. uh, on that and have Drupal.org run Composer, package it, you know, make it available for the download. So someone who's more of a hobbyist, you know, avoids. Uh, needing to understand some of those intricacies out of the, you know, out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Because um, downloading and installing Drupal right now, and you see that and you're like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But just to touch upon uh, what he was saying, I think the Composer module for Drupal 7 had a UI where you could just like update dependencies and it would work and they would not need to use command lines. So something could be developed. So. You know, users that are not so technical can still have like a download download a module and uh, have the advantages of having composer back uh, uh, a composer enabled site without actually running composer. Yeah, it's tricky though because if if your site is set up such that that works, it's not installed securely. So, um, so book module. This is actually um, people know what book module does, and how many people install it. Uh, a few, a few, uh, some enthusiastically. <laughs> um, so, um, to me, this is actually one of the most overlooked modules in core, and um, I say that as being the listed maintainers. Uh, um, and I, I, I think it may be that the name alone is one of the reasons why this uh, module is sort of uh, possibly on the hit list. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, I would, I, I, I think we should basically. Remove this one from core, but replace it with something better and with a better name. Um, so book module has a limitation, only handles nodes, um, not other entity types. Um, and yeah, the name is confusing. And if you called it content hierarchy or a structured content module or something else like that, that actually explained what it did, um, probably a lot of people would like to use it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to give five thumbs up to that thing. <laughs> I, we actually talked on IRC about doing exactly that. Yeah. It just needs to be there to allow people to create hierarchical content, but book is a terrible name. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always under the impression that the one of the purposes of like the book module and the forum module was there to more or less test the APIs for Drupal core uh, specifically to make sure that these things were, you know, possible. It didn't seem to like the development of eight didn't really seem to go that way. Where uh, one of the two first things ported was book and forum and done in it like, okay, let's just get this code, you know, into the APIs as quickly as possible versus like, how can we redo this using Drupal 8's actual functionality? So I, I really think that these things should be in core, but, you know, rebuilt using, you know, things like views and uh, plugins and all the things that, you know, core now has versus this or strict hard coding that's uh, especially like the book module is full of just strict hard coding. Yeah, oh, I, I mean, I'm the one who did that port and part of the reason it looks that way is because we wanted to decouple it from the menu link hierarchy code, which um, when I, which I used, I basically in Drupal 6 used the same back end for the book module as the menu link system, which was great and it, we deployed it to Drupal.org and it handled, you know, 10,000 documentation pages um, that way with no problem and that, you know, but when we wanted to upgrade the menu system, we had to do that basically hack of, you know, splitting, splitting out that code and no one had, 
No one has found the time or energy to come back to it, which is another reason I strongly think we should replace it rather than fixing it. Right, and I, I do want to say that like I am using you know core book you know on Drupal eight, and I I really think that the functionality is great. I you know that ability to do the hierarchies was you know is really important to certain use cases. I'm just thinking about the maintenance burden for book and thinking about the migration of Drupal.org to well, Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, and I'm like, oh my god, that's well, yeah. <laughs> Drupal.org is already they've started they changed the documentation system, and I'm not sure I love it, but it's now using organic groups to provide the content hierarchy as opposed to book, which I think lost some important functionality, but people like the way it looks better, I guess, and it allowed them to designate maintainers for separate sections of the documentation, which was the key reason they did it that way. Um, okay, so getting close to the end of our, our hit list here, tour module. Anyone use tour module? Do people even know what tour module is? <laughs> okay, good, people know what it is. Um, do you know that there's only one tour in Drupal core? <laughs> and anyone know where to find it? This is enabled by default in your sites. And, and no, Wim is excluded from answering this question. <laughs> and Daniel. <laughs> Anyone else know? Yeah, in Views UI. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it was basically like added when right after Tour Module was added just to prove that it works, and then no one made another one. Yeah, I think Tour Module is great in theory. We should just leverage it more and like explain more pages with it and maybe see it as a, maybe in addition to help module. And or replacement, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really similar to help module in its functionality, I guess, but it's more user facing than, I guess. You could use yeah, it for so actual users. Right. I've heard of a few people writing, you know, custom tours for their sites to explain how the site works, but yeah, I don't feel like this, this one, it seems like it's a great idea, but yeah, not underutilized. So again, maybe does this need to be in core? Uh, maybe not for Drupal 9 unless we get more tours actually written and take advantage of it. Um, and last, RDF module. People, anyone use RDF module? A few, yeah? Um, so um, this is, was one of the really big features of Drupal 7. Um, and you know, I think it, it, it provides an important feature, but you know, it also has some problems. And in particular, one of the problems uh, I know David has run into was if you enable it on an existing site, it changes some of the markup. It may basically break uh, your existing theme work, which is not um, really that friendly to, to people. I mean, that's not a reason to remove it, but it's a, a caveat. Um, the other thing I found is that um, is no longer really the recommended format for enhancing your search results. So search engines like Google will use RDFA data to enhance the search results um, on their page because they get more information about what the data means. Um, but it's like the last option they recommend, and they would rather have you using um, JSON LD to describe uh, the content on the page in a machine readable way. Um, so, you know, what's the future for this? Should we still be, have this in Drupal 9? Should we switch to JSON LD? Um, anyone have opinions on this? Because this is, again, I think it's uh, really important to get good search results for your site, but um, I don't know if this is the right approach anymore. Yeah, I think it's something that should be definitely removed from core on the basis of it no longer being a best practice and not wanting to, in core, promote use of technologies that aren't best practice. Um, I don't think that necessarily an RDF implementation should stay in core, but you know, possibly a more generic API that allows, uh, allows for you know, markup extensibility outside of core, so like to have contrib plugins that can then you know, modify the markup in ways so that it's more future-proof, uh, much uh, more like the the way that the yeah you know, the layout engine uh, for the experiments in Drupal 8 is there, so that modules like uh, um, uh, like display suites and panels can have a like a backend that's running their stuff without having to re-implement like half of core. Uh, so doing something along those lines that provides that core. Uh, you know, API for contrib to implements, uh, I think would be a better approach. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, we need to keep that. I don't know if anybody's familiar with schema.org. 
or not. Mm -hmm. So schema.org is using the RDF yeah. and it's highly recommended for the search engine optimization. So uh, I'm using since Drupal 7, the schema.org and RDF module and it's still in our full Drupal 8 site we're using that. Yeah, I mean, it works well, and yeah, the search engines still use it, and yeah, schema.org is very interesting because it gives you a lot of ways to describe the data. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm just worried, yeah. If people it, are not using that because my, maybe they are not familiar with schema.org, but it's, right. if they are familiar, they would say we keep it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, and um, yeah, someone asked earlier about usage. Um, if you go to this page on Drupal.org, um, people recently tried to parse basically the, you know, update status callbacks and get some sense of you know, how many people had enabled you know, non-default modules in core. Um, and so there's some data there, but you need to take that data with a big grain of salt, and I'm not sure we'd want to base decisions on it, because um, that data also includes uh, callbacks from the test bots that are running tests on these modules. So um, uh, it's been suggested to me that the, the usage numbers for some of these lower range modules might reflect their test coverage uh, completeness more than their actual usage in real life. Um, so, uh, you know, so basically we don't have good numbers. You know, either really a good sense of what the maintenance burden of these things is um, or, you know, how many people are really using them, how many people uh, need them out of the box uh, in Drupal core. Uh, we should have the numbers of the amount of test bots that are being run, so we should be able to figure out what the actual noise floor is, and then, you know, uh, cut that off so that we can... Yeah, I mean, in theory, we, with with enough effort, we could... Actually, yeah. you should have the test bots hard code to site ID. Hmm, that'd be easier, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so we've heard, yeah, people suggest things like maybe we can split out these modules and then recompose the site or, you know, cut Drupal down to a framework and... Yeah, so I, I think a lot of people have come to the same conclusion about, you know, can we do like a small core kind of thing? Um, I, I wrote a blog post about this that I put out last week discussing um, sort of pros and cons of small core and different ways to handle that. Um, and some other people have written some recent blog posts about it as well. Um, but this is a discussion we've had for a really long time. Small core is not a new thing. Uh, people have wanted that for a long time. And that dis those um, advocates have never won out for a really important reason. Um, we have sort of two ends of a spectrum here where it's people who are more interested in Drupal as the framework and people who are more interested in Drupal as the product. Um, and the product has always won, and it's won for a very good reason, because Drupal needs to be something that people can download and use. And, you know, as, as many people have already said here, you've, you started out as site builders, as, as newbies, um, and if you had started with Drupal just being a framework and you downloaded it and you got a bunch of uh, PHP code and you essentially have to do all the work to build it yourself from scratch, that's, um, that's something that really only a developer is looking for. That's not something that someone's looking to just download and use and just click buttons and turn mod features on and, and use them out of the box. Um, so uh, the product has always won that discussion. But I don't think that we need to leave it there. I, I was thinking of different ways that we might be able to do both. And so we're discussing more and more now things about like just using distributions and stuff like that. So one of the ideas I had is, well, maybe, you know, maybe we can do both. Um, so if you, if you look at my blog post, you'll see more details about what I was writing about. But the idea I had was essentially, can we get back to small core and have something that's really focused on just the APIs and let the developers who want to just work on those APIs work on that um, and iterate and innovate on those things um, and take all the modules and the themes and everything else, put them into Contrib, but don't abandon them in Contrib. Put them into Contrib in a state that's essentially still maintained by the core development team. So each like module maintainer becomes that module maintainer in Contrib and the core team has maintainer access to those modules and is still maintaining them the same way they probably would on the same schedule with core, but have them separated so the module maintainers can innovate on them, add new features, do different things that they want to do. And then because we've got these new composer workflows now, we could do something like build a distribution, but I wouldn't just build, let anybody build a distribution. We should have an official Drupal core distribution that is maintained by a core development team so that we could essentially 
go to drupal.org slash project slash Drupal, get that page that everybody goes to, and you can have a button that says download Drupal 8, and you can have a button that says download Drupal 8 core. And core would just give you those APIs and the things that you need. And then the download button for just Drupal 8 would essentially be a prepackaged distribution that has the standard install profile the way it does now, and drupal.org would just package it. I think if we did something like that, both sides would get what they want. The site builders can still have what they want. The product team gets what they want. The people who care about small core and APIs get what they want. And I think it frees up both sides to be more innovative. Because one of the things that I think is really a problem now is because the sort of like framework people maintain everything, it's harder to actually get innovation on the product level. Right, so when product people are making decisions like UX decisions and modules we need to add and features and like why is beta tag and path auto not in core and things like that, right? If that was being done in a distribution, the product team has freer will to do the things that they want to do that makes sense. So things like the out of box initiative that's being worked on with default content and a new theme and stuff like that, the core API doesn't have to care about any of that because it will never be part of that download. That will just be something that gets added to the distribution and is there to demo features and content for people who want that. So if you just download Core, you don't even get that software. Because I've already heard complaints from people like, you're now adding another thing. It's going to have all of these files and all of this code. And is that default content going to come with images? And now that's going to be like in my build process, having all this garbage that's in there. And if we keep adding more and more and stuff, that, that download, that installation just gets bigger and bigger for things that maybe 90% of people don't even need that are there just for demos and stuff like that. And I think the other advantage is if, if we can get to a small core that's actually accessible to people, it opens up a lot more possibilities and interest for people building distributions that are particular to things like a community or publishing or things like that. And those people who are maintaining those distributions can focus on just adding the things they want to build a Drupal product the way they want and not, well, I have to like try to figure out ways to get rid of all this stuff in core and modify and override stuff I don't need. Right, like so imagine being able to just download a core and it doesn't have the themes in it, right? And you decide I don't need classy and I don't need Bartek and I don't need seven because I'm gonna use ad minimal as the, the admin theme for this and I have a better version, you know, in contrib there's a better version of the toolbar module and a better version of the shortcut module and we can use those and package those as a distribution and those other things don't even show up there. So we can see more of this um, landscape of like flavors of Drupal that people are building out and even have their own different frameworks in them and then see like which things are working better and then maybe we start going that direction in the official distribution when something works on something and they find something better. And then th when things like um, path auto become stable in the distribution, that can just be added to the composer file and then that just immediately starts getting pulled in. You don't even have to worry about how that gets added into core. It just becomes part of the distribution and part of the product. So I just want to say we're running out of time. So um, just quick note, there are sprints. So come on Friday. Uh, please evaluate this session. This is node 17573. So please give us feedback and we can continue talking for a couple more minutes, but just wanted to respect people's time. As of, I don't know, last week or something, we actually expose the, the components we provide in, uh, as um, like a packages package. Um, I wonder whether we could actually expose every core module as a package Yeah, so on I think Composer. We, we would need to do that or want to do that to start experimenting with this. Yeah, yeah. right, and continuous. And yeah, I think that would solve a lot of this distribution or a small core thing, actually. We would still, I mean, that model would still maintain everything but at least you could remove all the other things. The other question I have is how does that removing of features work together with the stuff Dries was talking about, which is like the continuous upgrade path from DA to D9 and you can just do things. Like with, because you are removing features, you, you can't provide like an update path. Or right. Like some well, smooth transition for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, if those things are moved to contrib, as the first step and are still minimally maintained by the same group of people, um, you would essentially like be moving its location. You might still be able to have a, like a minimal upgrade path, at least for a time. But at some point, yeah, you'd have to figure out like an alternate solution or whatever. You know, those are you know devils in the detail and that kind of implementation. I just wanted to, to say that I'm, unless I'm mistaken, I've heard 
I heard Dries say everything you just said back in Denver at a core conversation. Uh, so the, uh, the big difference between now and then is that now with Composer, we have the, you know, we can do that without, you know, and still have the, you know, the versions and semantic versioning and all that stuff. All of the groundwork has been laid now. So this is actually much more of a possibility now than it was then. So I think that this is, a, you know, a great idea moving yeah. forward. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone for your comments and thanks for coming. in there would just be whatever that core distribution is and then you're adding these 